Hi everybody, welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm gonna let you all get into here into the chat for like one minute and then we'll begin. Uh Brett, how are you doing? I'm doing good. Doing I'm good? doing really good. So uh, yeah. hello, how are you doing? Hi hey guys. Hi everybody. We'll just wait for just a bit more so people can come in before we start. Hi, Sia. Hi, Nathan. Hi, Dio. Hello, hello, hello. Hi, Marcia. Okay. Let's just begin. Yeah. Uh, with me, some of you guys already know who the person with me is. It, uh, his name is Britt Snyder. He's a figurative painter. Uh, and I'll let him do his own introduction yeah. today. Perfect. So, Britt. Yeah, hi guys, and um, the stage is yours. Uh, just a quick disclaimer, I don't know where everybody else is, but I'm in Massachusetts um, in the States and it is hot. <laughs> and I'm in the middle of a home emergency, so we don't have any air conditioning. So if you see me kind of um, mopping my brow, I am, in, I am in sweltering heat, unfortunately. So I apologize for that. So anyway, um, I want to say thanks for coming. Um, I've gotten to know a number of you guys over the past uh, few months in group coaching. And um, those that don't know me yet, um, I'm mostly an oil painter these days. That's what I'm focused on, oil painting and teaching. Prior to that, I worked in the game industry. So I worked in video games for a number of years. I made games for Blizzard for um, the Warcraft 3 and Diablo 2 expansion set. Um, Wally, um, the, the movie game for Nintendo DS, I worked for a company called THQ, a game called The Blob, Rock Band Green Day, and a whole bunch of other games. Um, and I also freelance in addition to painting. I, I freelance for game studios as well and make art. Um, so uh, in addition to that, I've been, um, for my painting, I've been uh, I've shown in a number of galleries. I currently show through uh, DK Gallery in Marietta, Georgia, and a little bit through Robert Lang Studios in South Carolina. Uh, my work's been in Southwest Art Magazine, American Art Collector, The Artist Magazine, Spectrum Illustration, just kind of a bunch of stuff, and that's that. And uh, before I get into this, um, I wanted to touch base and just say that I'm really proud and happy to be invited to this with new masters, and I wanted to kind of give you a little bit of context for um, my uh, background with this. So Mark Westermo was one of the teachers in New Masters and uh, was absolutely integral to my development. So um, when I was looking to break in, just kind of looking to do art, I took lessons through Mark and that gave me the tools to break into video game development. And then while I was in video game development, I took about a year off and I spent all kinds of money studying and just hanging out with Mark Westermore, you'll find his videos on there. But it was great because when I when I uh, went back in industry, my salary jumped more than I had spent to study with him. And ever since then, um, you know, I've taken classes when I used to live in Los Angeles with us, uh, Steve Houston, I was a student along with Joseph Todorovic, a whole bunch of people, Glenn Bilpu in these videos. And um, I just can't say enough, uh, truly about how amazing that's been for me as an artist. Um, so once again, like all of us, if you do this for long enough, you're gonna have ups and downs, but I sort of feel, no, I do feel that the lessons that I've had with these people have just been there and just carried me through everything. So once again, I just can't say enough um, about the quality of the people in teaching these classes and also just um, celebrating this 10 years. I truly think that this is a service um, that they've done to get this stuff on video. So once again, I'm kind of getting older. And when, when I was learning this stuff, I had to drive and travel with these people, but it's on video now. It's absolutely amazing. Um, the quality of the videos and these people that I used to travel two hours to drive to study with, it's just all right there for you. So um, thank you so much for coming. Uh, that's a quick background. I can answer questions about it. I have a background with a number of the teachers in this, and I'm so happy to be here for it. And I just, you know, I really believe in what we're doing here. And I think it's a great thing and I'm happy to have you here. So let's get into it. And once again, I apologize. It's like 95 and humid here. So if you see this, I'm just, um, you'll see me here and there. I could not locate a fan fast enough. <laughs> okay. Yeah. It. Before we begin everything, I would just like to say also from New Masters Academy, we're very happy to have you in our group coaching program nice. too. Yeah. <laughs> So it's it's an honor to be studying, uh, you know, with uh, under you with it's an you. Easy gig, to talk art with um, people, and have fun. Easy gig, man. It's fun. It's very the discussions are very fun. Yeah, everything sure. so good. <laughs> okay, um, guys, just before we start the Q and A, I would like to ask you guys to. Um, <laughs> 
I got lost for yeah. a second. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry, no, guys. No. Uh, because we value uh, your experience as a new master student, and we strive to provide you with the best online art education possible, I would like you all to check out our feedback form down in this corner, please. Um, your feedback will ensure us uh, will ensure, ensure us that we're meeting your expectations and help us uh, consciously improving our courses with the help of your valuable input. By participating in this evaluation, you'll automatically be entered into another draw, and this one is to win one of the following prizes: a free individual coaching session or one month of our group coaching access. The deadline to complete this form is July 31st of this month, obviously. So yeah, everybody welcome to participate in this survey. Um, but yeah, um, this with this out of the way, we're just gonna start into the questions. Please feel free to ask questions while we are discussing stuff. Like we always appreciate any questions you guys might oh, have. For sure. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, so, Britt, tell us uh, about your painting style and what first sparked an interest in in your medium of choice. So, I've always kind of been, um, I've always kind of painted the way that I painted in a sense. So, um, that's a really interesting question. I don't think that I ever really, that's a really interesting question. Why do I, did I paint this way? Um, it was just sort of what was put in front of me. So when I was in school, for whatever reason, you, you will sort of commonly have people say, well, let's start with gouache and then we'll graduate to oils. And oils were just kind of put in front of me. And I've just naturally always been really interested in the figure. Um, that was just, um, that's just sort of been ingrained in me since I've been, uh, my grandfather was an illustrator and I kind of grew up just loving figure and figurative art. And, uh, you know, oils were just kind of um, what was given to me in school. And, and I just kind of launched into it. Um, a little bit longer story than that. Um, I, I was working in games. And even when I was in games, I was always kind of a painter. I was doing more digital painting. But uh, then, um, you know, when I decided that I wanted to transition into oils, I was able to take a lot of that information that I did on painting for games and transition it into uh, painting for oils. And uh, yeah. Very interesting. Yeah. Um, okay, maybe do you have any advice for other artists? Any lessons you wished you learned earlier in your career when you started out? Um, I would say um, stay in school as long as you can. So one of the things that was really hard for me was I got good enough where I was able to um, I was able to work, but it wasn't good enough to really get me to where I wanted to be. So I guess um, what I mean by that is it seemed you know, oh, you're good enough to get the job you want. You want to work in games. But then once I got into game development, I started to want to do other things. I started to want to kind of rise and do more interesting things at the studio. But my education wasn't complete in a sense. And so I felt kind of trapped. So what I would do differently, and I've, I've made up for it since then, but what I would do differently is I would have tried to stay in school a little bit longer and gotten my training a little more under my belt. I felt like I kind of had to learn in public and learn on the job, which is normal, but I think I did that a little bit too much. So basically, if you can, if you have the ability to do it, I would say stay in school and really get your fundamentals down as much as possible before you go into any kind of industry, because like I say, it's gonna carry you. And if you decide that you wanna do something different, eventually um, you're gonna be really glad that you had those classes. That's, that's what I would say. Okay, uh, next question would be, how do you go about choosing your color palettes? Um, so I think my palette is actually kind of a reflection of where I live. So I live in um, kind of a very green, like I'm looking outside my window here in this blazing hot lake that I'm living in right now, but um, everything is green and blue. And I feel like my palette is a reflection of where I live and the kind of work that I wanted to make. Um, I also, I use a pretty limited palette and I've just gotten kind of used to that and that works its way into my painting. So uh, like a lot of people, I start out by painting with the Zorn palette, which is really just a four color palette. And I really paint pretty much that way right now with maybe six or seven other colors that kind of change out um, to complement it. So I really do kind of work still with a pretty limited palette. I like, 
I just like the look of it. You know, I don't, um, some people love a lot of color and a lot of saturation in their work. And uh, just me personally, I really like, um, that's kind of what I'm going for. I like that sort of moody um, palette. It's just what, what resonates with me. Yeah, I'm a pretty big fan of your palette. Oh, thanks, I appreciate <laughs> it. In all your works. Yeah, you know, um, yeah, well, one thing I will add to that is, um, is a lot of times uh, it, um, things I think can work their way in that you are around. So when I was a student, there was a painter, a lot of you guys might uh, be aware of him, Jeremy Lipking. And when um, Jeremy was a student a little bit before me, but he was still kind of around the school at that time. And I remember we all went over to his house one night and he was in this phase where he was painting everything kind of green and moody. And I think that's actually part of it because I've always loved Jeremy's work. And I think just, he doesn't really paint as much that way anymore, but I remember just that period of time of his work was so lined up when, with when I was developing that I think um, I'll kind of credit him a lot with, um, I just love that sort of early 2000s work he was doing. And I think I still, you know, still kind of go back to it. Phil Hale's an artist that I like a lot with the, in, on the illustration side of things. And Phil uses a really limited palette. And just a lot of those people I still, um, Wyeth, Andrew Wyeth has, I just kind of like that limited palette look. Okay, we already jumped a bit into the next question where I wanted to ask you who influenced your art style. I know you're a huge fan of Sargent. I love Sargent. Um, really a lot of people. So um, I like a lot of different things and I, I, I sort of have sides to what I do that I don't show. So once again, I talked a little bit about game development and when I'm doing game dev art, you really wouldn't know it's me. It looks completely different. Um, but the stuff that feels the most like me kind of does go to Sargent. I will talk about Sargent. And like a lot of people, I love Sargent's paintings. Um, Sargent was a huge one. Uh, boy, I'm trying to think. Really, there's so many, I almost don't even know. Um, I love the sort of 1800s Impressionism. And I actually love a lot of the Golden Age illustrations. So for when I was a student, I looked at a lot of J.C. Leindecker, a lot of Rockwell, Dean Cornwell, um, NCY at that kind of stuff. And I copied, copied, copied. So I still have a lot of that in my work. You don't see it as much, but um, I really do um, love that sort of golden age illustration work. Mm -hmm. um, what challenges do you usually stumble upon when you are creating a new piece? Um, I stumble with getting out of my head. So um, I think I can probably speak for a lot of us um, when I say that when I finish something, it doesn't oftentimes uh, have the have the result that I that I wanted it to be. And I don't know. I'll, once again, I can sort of you know so we can see in the comments if you guys feel the same. But a lot of times I feel I go on sprees where I'm just hitting the mark, and my work's selling or it's whatever it's just everything is kind of going well and then i'll hit a rut where i'm not and i actually don't even get frustrated with it anymore i just kind of go well i'm in a rut that's fine it will come out of it um so things that i struggle with would be consistency i struggle with um getting in ruts and i struggle with making work that when i'm doing it i think it's the greatest thing in the world i'm feeling like oh this is a breakthrough and then and then i finish it and i'm just like oh, this is not even close it's not even good let alone a breakthrough Oh, um, um, Alex, I see a question here too, a question about my studio space. And that's funny you should ask. Can I talk yeah. about that for a sec? Um, yeah, of I'm course. So, I'm glad you're going to. Yeah, that's actually it. been an interesting thing. So I'm a dad and my kid is now 15. She just turned 15. And I've always, I've tried working out of the house. I had a studio that was in a warehouse. But the problem is, and those of you that are parents can understand, I would kind of go in triangles, picking up my kid, going to the studio, going home. And so I found it necessary from a practical place to just work from home. So, so for the past eight months, I've actually been painting the corner of this little room in my basement, which is where I am right now. And just next week, um, we are having a shed built out actually right behind me. And my workspace is going to be um, an 18 by 14 uh, shed with we're finishing it with drywall and heat and seven foot ceilings um i have north facing light so once again this is all going to be put together next week i'm going to have north facing light that's really important to me and i need to have enough the reason why it's 18 by 14 is because i need to have a runway that i can back up so i really don't um i don't do well if i'm just kind of like stuck there and having to paint i need to have a place that i can kind of back up and see my work from afar 
Um, so 18 by 14 shed, we're going to paint the walls neutral gray. And that's because I really actually believe this, um, the colors, especially as a painter, the colors that you're around are going to affect your painting. So if you have artificial light or if you've got like red walls, your eye is actually seeing it and it's going to filter into your color choice. So I always do a neutral wall. So answer the question, seven foot, um, 18 foot backup space and north facing light and that's and that's um right out in my yard now we're, we're building that and that's for practical reasons because i just being a dad i can't drive off half an hour to somewhere and then need to you know be a bus for a yet to drive child yeah and the cedar is fabulous in the middle of the garden oh you saw it that's right it's quite i think nice. i even showed you guys where I'm yeah going. you showed yeah. us yep, we, we <laughs> the other day we're, yeah. we're traveling it's, it's beautiful yeah it's going to be amazing yeah <laughs> Okay, um, okay. Uh, let's go to another question. Yeah. And I got blurry all of a sudden. Whoa, I don't know why. Um, now you guys know how it looks like if I put down my glasses. Oh, do you want me to do? <laughs> how do? You... Oh yeah, sure. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's sure. fine. Uh, how do you get your work shown shown in a gallery? Um, I would say, um, um, and, and the reason I go, I would say, is because it's going to be different for everybody. For me. It was numbers. Um, so I, I do believe that that if your work is at a place where that's makes sense, somebody's going to say yes. What I did was I sent unsolicited messages out to galleries, and surprisingly, they, a lot of them are actually responsive. There will be places that will not be responsive. There are places that are just like lines of people lined up to stop you from getting the person who's going to have to answer that. Um, also, um, there are galleries quite commonly, you will see a gallery with um, 30 people listed on the website, and they've got all the people they can handle. Not that they don't like your work, but but uh, they're basically handling the people that they represent. And that's the way it is. Um, I got in by just applying to places, and I got enough yeses. And eventually it translated to um, finding places that worked for me. And in all honesty, um, I change that up sometimes. And and I, I about every couple of years, I will sort of like explore new things. I, I'm actually in the next couple months, I, I've got a whole like list of things of places that I'm like, this might work, this might work, and I might make some adjustments. So yeah. Okay, we have a follow up mm -hmm. question from the previous answer. Sure. Uh, since you talked about getting out of a rut, did it always come easy for you to get out of it? Did you ever get stuck and had doubts about your art career? So I've never had doubts about my art career. I will say this. Um, uh, that's kind of what I touched on um, sincerely when I said about New Masters. This has been so kind to me, art. Um, it's been the most kind thing um, ever. It never lets me down. Like I say, like ever since I... Um, I made the decision of, I think I'm going to pursue this in a serious way. I can't, it just never ultimately lets me down. So uh, honestly, I never had doubts about that. Um, as far as getting out of a rut goes, um, I think the trick is just work and then be smart. So what I try to do when I'm in a rut is I just kind of let it go. Um, and I might turn my attention elsewhere for a bit. I might kind of get out and see new things. Um, sometimes I just kind of let it go. So um, so I'm in a little bit of a rut with my painting at the moment. Um, so I've actually taken on some freelance jobs for games. In the fall, I'm going to have my new studio. I'm going to jump back in. I'll feel refreshed. So I just kind of, I don't worry about it. I go, I'm in a rut. It's okay. It's happened like 10 times before. Um, and something good always comes from it. So let's do this other fun thing that's over here for a little bit. And then we'll, we'll jump back in and do that um, in a couple months. And so I basically just kind of jump around to different things and um, keep myself fresh. And when I'm in a rut, um, I don't get frustrated with it. I just find other things to do. Um, and eventually I get out of it. Always happens. Okay, awesome. Okay, we have another question from Nathan. Mm -hmm. Hey, Britt, do you have any suggestions for artists starting making their art career and generating income with their work? So you can find income in a lot of ways. For me, um, Everybody has differing views on this. For me, income came in the form of working for other people. So, um, so I'm, I'm hesitant on it because there's so many, some people will say, start a Patreon, start this, and, and, and they would be right for them. Um, I would say, develop your skills first. Like that's kind of the obvious one, but it, it, it isn't always as followed as it should be. I would really 
like for example go through these lessons and get your foundational skills right because you're going to have ups and downs in your career even if you quote unquote make it i got into sony or i got into disney they'll lay you off eventually or something's going to happen there will be some bump in the road but if you've got those skills you're gonna somebody will pick you up so um first and foremost get your skills where they need to be and and that will take care of a lot of things for you um in the future and then as far as um what to do I always kind of keep my eye open to the practical side of things as well. So these days, maybe it would be, you know, getting a following on Instagram, which I'm not not very good at or qualified to tell you to do. Um, but, uh, you know, there's just a lot of different paths. I could tell you about game development. That that's um, There's a lot of opportunity there. Um, galleries are tricky. Um, I could go into the specifics on that, but to really fully um, make a living at galleries, you really have to sell at a pretty high price point for a number of reasons. So I'll kind of just quickly break that down. You do a 50-50 split with the gallery. Um, you ultimately pay for the framing and then you have to pay taxes on the work. So you can kind of do the math on that. That can get pretty damn expensive. <laughs> so um, I, for most people, including myself with galleries, um, if you want to be uncompromising and just do the kind of work that you want to do, you're going to have to um, find other things, teach, freelance, other stuff to kind of make it work. And that's fine. That's that's the way it is for almost everybody. Okay. Um, do you do studies for your paintings or small ideas or research for any of your projects? I do. And it depends. It's sort of all over the map. Um, sometimes I will do a little color study that can really help. Um, I will thumbnail things. It's um, it is really important to see something. Something has to work at a small size to work at a big size. So yeah, I do a ton of preliminary work. In fact, actually, um, by the time that I get my thing up on the canvas, that's all been done, and I'm just painting. So um, some people will actually kind of get on the canvas and invent and stuff like that. I actually have it all worked out before I go, and I do that all through preliminary stuff. Um, if you are learning primarily digitally mm -hmm. are there things or concepts you would do differently or keep in mind when studying and practicing compared to traditional art i think they're kind of different things and um and one of the things about digital is i can relate to that because i learned how to paint digital so when i was in school the first round i talked about how there were two rounds one was sort of the round that got me into school got me into the industry and then i i said i didn't feel like i was developed enough i quit studied with Mark for about another year. And then I felt like I kind of had gotten my Jedi training, so to speak. Um, painting was one of those things. When I was in school, the first round, I, I really didn't paint much. It was just a ton of figure drawing. And, um, and then good enough to work, here you go. But I really didn't know how to paint. And then I learned how to paint digital first before I painted traditional. Um, in all honesty, it kind of messed with me a little bit. Um, not gonna lie. Um, digital painting to me is awesome, but it's a really different thing. It mimics traditional paint, but not really in the way that you paint traditionally. So the best thing I would say is if you're painting digital, I would do your best to supplement it with some traditional media. Watercolor and gouache are really cheap. Um, and I would think more in terms of color, not necessarily technique that would transfer. So um, when you once again, when you're painting digital, you'll find um, a lot of those techniques when you actually pick up paint, they don't transfer that well. It seems like it would, but it doesn't. I had a lot of trouble with that, actually. Okay. Um, oh, talking about video game industry, what has been your absolute favorite part of working in video game industry? Making monsters. <laughs> so like said, I'm taking a little time off and I'm, I'm designing this uh, boss creature for, um, I'm doing a little game for an indie company project for about a year or something like that on and off. And I'm, I'm doing this uh, monster, which is tons of fun. So um, it's goofy. You know, you're making like these like goofy creatures and you're working with other people. It's a lot of fun. You're making a toy. Um, and there's a lot of problem solving. So you've got, um, you've got a team of, you know, I don't know, it could be as many as like as seven to 50 or more artists working together. And um, I miss working in the studios because uh, there were just a lot of really talented people, you know, and, and, and you really grow a lot and get to work with different people. So I just think the most fun part is you're making toys with with um, what should be ultimately friends. Like like a lot of my experiences were um, we got very close while working on it. So it was a group of pirates basically in, in a studio making toys together. Just a normal work day. Yeah, seriously. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> 
I don't think I've ever worked a normal job. What advice would you give an inspiring painter who is starting college? Um, so let me ask a question back so I kind of understand. Um, what uh, do you do you want to paint um, re realistic stuff? And and I guess uh, I guess the question is, um, is uh, what are the goals? Are we talking about um, like what you'd like to learn or what you'd like for a career? I mean, they're all kind of different. There's a lot of advice that you could give with that. I don't mean to push it back. I just would like to kind of understand a little more. Realism and portraits figurative. Okay. That's all right. So um, Rose, what I would say is um, if you want to uh, do something with it as a career, um, the key is connection. So there's a lot of people that paint really well, but they can't connect with their work. Meaning you will see a lot of people that will paint really wonderful portraits where they're, you know, they're posed and whatever, but you'll, or at least I'll hear them sometimes griping about um, oh, the galleries won't take my work um, or whatever. Um, so I would say that just my opinion, but if you do that kind of stuff, there's really two sides of it. The first one is technique, and that's kind of what we're doing here in New Masters, and that's wonderful and fun. You can you can just get that technique, understand structure, gesture, um, all that stuff, you know, tone, everything. And then the next part is is if you want if you want to take it further, um, think about connection. So think about what you're going to do with that work. And that is actually trickier than you would imagine. And I've seen a lot of people really struggle with that, especially with realism and portraits. So the most common thing I'll say is someone will be like, well, let's make it narrative and let's have a bloody rose in their hand because it symbolizes, you know, but if look at people like i'll give you some people to look at look at um bo bartlett is a good one to look at that you that does figurative work but kind of says something with it um jenny seville s-a-v-i-l-l-e or savile i'm not sure how you pronounce her name is a great artist to look at that does that kind of thing um zoe frank i think i think i have her name right zoe frank is an amazing painter that paints figurative stuff but it really says something so i would say don't just think about technique look at those other people as well and see how they um so how they say something with their work. Okay. Um, okay, we're, we're at the like halfway point of this interview, Britt. I just want to check in with you since it's like a little heat wave. I'm or feeling off now that I'm feeling down. Okay? I was running around before, so I worked up some heat, but now that I'm just sort of parked here, I'm doing okay. <laughs> so it's just, yeah, it uh, so, so it's better now. Blazing hot out, but 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 I, I'm actually totally fine. I wish I'd been able to get that that uh, fan, but let's not burden um, burden everyone with that. So I'm sure we all. Uh, okay. I, people were saying they wish it was warm where they where they are. So I get it. Yeah. I I just wish to check if you're feeling all right because totally we could yeah. like postpone the interview. No, if you didn't. no I'm totally fine. Okay. No, I'm I'm all good. Don't don't. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay, then let's continue if you're fine with it. Yes. Um, do you recommend people jump into painting or have good grasp on drawing first? Or should we learn both at the same time? So um, I have a interesting response about this. The, the conventional wisdom that is generally right is that you should draw and then paint. And that is very accurate. It's cheaper. You can learn to draw with fine charcoal and that feels a lot like paint if you're kind of picking things out. That is great. I have, however, seen people who um, draw and express themselves better in paint. So um, uh, we'll kind of go back to Jeremy Lipking. That was somebody like that. Jeremy from a really, um, if you guys aren't familiar with his work, it's um, J Jeremy, J-E-R-E-M-Y space L-I-P-K-I-N-G, Jeremy Lipking. And Jeremy from a really early stage, I remember seeing he, he painted and he expressed himself really well as a painter. So he drew really well in paint. In fact, in my opinion, it was almost, I almost thought he draw, drew stronger in paint than he did with, um, with uh, traditional media. There are people like that. So, um, so the, the conventional wisdom is yes, learn how to draw, it's cheaper. It is a solid way to think about things. I have seen some people who they just, they draw in paint. It's just, it's just how it is. I don't know, you do see that sometimes. So. The brown bot answer. Um, generally speaking, yes, learn to draw. Um, there are people um, who are just, I, I do believe it. Um, that's controversial. Some people quarrel with me about that. But that's that's how I feel. Yeah. Okay. Um, when starting to paint, 
master studies first or own personal projects? Oh, I think master studies are great. Um, so inter interesting answer on that, at least in my opinion as well, is do a little of both. So I always think that you don't want to um, 100% study, you've got to have a little passion. I'll kind of go back to Mark Westrom again. Mark actually took me aside it was like 20 some years ago and I was taking nothing but the figure drawing classes. And, and this is a guy who emphasized that and knew that. And he actually said, he's like, you really should do some other stuff too. Like, like you're doing enough figure drawing, I get it, but you've got to do some other stuff and kind of get that out of you. Um, so I'm a huge fan of master studies. I, I always say, try your own stuff in there. Um, I would lean towards master studies in the beginning, and I would just always um, strive to apply it to your own stuff just because it's fun. You know, it'll help you out. Uh, oh, we have a question from group coaching session. Um, you mentioned in a previous group coaching session that you're always learning from your students. What sort of thing are you picking up that you didn't know about before? Oh. Um, just everything. We're all, um, everybody does things in a different way. So it doesn't really matter, um, where anybody is at in their development. You're going to see, um, you're going to see something that they're doing that, that's like, oh, that's really interesting. I wouldn't, um, I would think about it not quite that way. And that's an interesting thing. So sometimes, um, a lot of times I'll see, um, well, Alex, we'll talk about you, like, like you were doing really interesting things with your straights on 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 your figures you know the way you're defining them and um and you know i've done that obviously over the years in my own work but that kind of was like a little reminder i'm like i really should think more about that you know like kind of go back and kind of work on that so once again i don't think it's just my students i think it's everybody so you can learn from anyone <laughs> i'm honored to be an example <laughs> Good yeah. Yeah. um Okay, let's check some other questions. Do you have any advice for somebody who is middle age, struggles to commit to the amount of time required to really progress and can find any local art classes? Also, space is limited, so traditional painting isn't really an option, plus the cost involved, so it's more likely to be digital. Um, I would say just be realistic about what you can what you can commit to it, what you what you're going to get out of it and keep your focus on i think this applies to every all of us at, at all times keep your focus on just learning things that are foundational and that are interesting to you you know and 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 uh and keep it fun you know don't don't burn out like if you can't if you can't commit to um using traditional media you don't have the space you don't have the time that's, that's fine you know just get what you can out of it and also one thing i will say about this too um i've taught quite a bit and i've also um I, i've also you know had a ton of teachers and fellow students the strongest people i'm going to say this almost without exception the strongest people i've ever seen it happens very slowly um the people who i was in class with that kind of quote unquote got really good really fast um almost invariably kind of stalled out or burned out and the people that i saw that would just kind of slowly get better and better and better i don't know what it is it's a healthier learning curve so it takes longer. It's not. It's it's not for the impatient. But um, that's been my experience. People that, that develop slow, um, it's almost always uh, better in the long run. So I hope that answers um, just my thoughts on that. It's almost like I would like write that question myself. Yeah. <laughs> so well, Shane, I know the feel. I can give you a really good example. Um, there was um, um years ago. Um, I was at a place called Watts Atelier, and there was an artist, Eric Just, that still teaches there. And Eric, um, I've said this to him myself, is the ultimate example of that. First off, Eric's amazing. He's always been amazing, but he's getting more amazing. And um, and I don't know if he shows his old work, but he's been like this. And 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 I never saw Eric go like this. Eric was always kind of like this, and just steadily climbing to awesomeness, you know. And it's been like um, watching him over the years. Um, I think it's a really good good example of just kind of what to strive for. I just feel like he's gotten amazing at a really healthy rate. Somebody look at Eric um, E R I K um, G I S T. Yeah. Yeah. Anytime we put down a pencil, we're always progressing somewhere. Totally. Yeah. It's better than it's better than not picking it up and just staring at a blank paper. By the way, I'll say something um, to this too. Just one last thing to that. Um, this is something that you can't teach. Some people make work that is quote unquote, not 
amazing, but everybody loves it. You know, your work doesn't always have to be technically amazing to have a lot of charisma and connect with people too. Just saying, you know, there's a lot of, lot of artists that aren't the most technical and I just love their work. Um, I'll give you one example, um, at least in the States. Do you guys know Shel Silverstein, the, the author? Where the Sidewalk Ends? They're these sort of little cartoony things. It's nothing amazing, but um, the work is just amazing. So, you know, what can you say? Okay. Um, Marcha, Marcha is asking, do you have any routines to keep your creative practices sustainable? Um, just keep it fun, first and foremost. Um, when it gets unfun, um, it, then, 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 it, then it's not sustainable. Um, I don't know what it is. I've always loved the foundations. It's never been work for me. So I always w was... I'm, I'm giving a talk, I think, next week on head structure. I've always been fascinated with it. It was never work for me. I, I loved it. Um, Color is always fascinating to me. Um, just stay interested in it in any way. I don't know why it's interesting to me. It just naturally is. I don't struggle with it um, being interesting. I struggle with learning it. I don't struggle with it being interesting. Um, I would say that if you're ever feeling burnout, just go with it, accept it, and just take some time off and go do something else. I play guitar. You know, it's fun for me. I, it just gets me out of, out of my headspace. Instead of climbing yeah, I would also I would also like to point out maybe plateaus. Some people struggle through them, uh, but I heard like a really good advice from one of our coaches, Patrick, mm -hmm. that you should just embrace those plateaus. That that is where actually most of the studying happens. Yeah. How would you say do you tackle your plateaus? I think actually what we're doing here, I think community is really helpful. So I sort of feel like. Um, like, like if I hit a plateau, it's time to uh, go out in the world a little bit, and interact with people. So I find um, I just naturally, if I just kind of get out of my room and go talk to other artists, I've got a group of friends. Um, I live near the city of Boston. We, we go out and, you know, talk art and go on camping trips and paint and this and that. And I find that just sort of recharges my juices. Talking here. Um, no, what, what he, what he said, that's awesome. Just, um, just, Hey, it's a plateau, you know, just um, you're going to hit it for a while and just, don't get burned out. The only reason I'm kind of um, calm about it is because I'm getting older and I've been doing this for a number of years. And I've kind of seen through history what happens. And, and I've, I've learned over the years, you just don't don't worry about it. It's just it's happened to me like eight times. Like, no worries. Yeah, I believe plateaus are scary at the beginning of an artist's yeah. career. Um, you know, like people start feeling like they're not progressing and then like you know darker thoughts come about like it happens to everybody you know so yeah just yeah i i heard a, t a, a talk recently there was um uh, carlos santana the guitar player was talking about there was um he in the 70s played with a guitar player named john mclaughlin who's this jazz wizard and and carlos was saying something to the effect of i'm paraphrasing but something like like i don't know as much as he knows um, I'm maybe in a lot of ways, not as good as he is on paper, but I've still got something to say. And I think that's really important too. So I think sometimes, um, plateaus can be you sort of comparing you to other people. Um, and I think that can, that can really kind of mess with your head and burn you out. So I think a good healthy way of looking at it is it doesn't matter if my nose that I drew isn't perfect. It doesn't matter if the structure isn't perfect. I'm still kind of making a unique statement. This is still helping my my life and um, and adding value. So I think with plateaus, I think sometimes just putting some perspective on it, like Patrick said, don't sweat it. And, um, and maybe, you know, see if you're comparing yourself to other people and take a little breather, even if you want to do it as a career, take a little breather from that thought. Exactly. Mm -hmm. The more you rush, the more you are gonna uh, stumble, they say. Sure, sure. So even when you have to rush, take it a bit slower. Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> Can you go over your cleaning process for your brushes after you're done sure. uh, painting? Um, so don't do this too hard. I was showing this um, in one of the Q and A's, and I take my brushes and I pinch, I pinch it with um, with paper, and I pull the paint out. I pulled it so hard that it actually pulled the brush bristles out. So um, don't do that. Um, what I do is um, is I use um, walnut oil and I'll just kind of, um, it'll be in my walnut oil, I'll dip it in a little bit. I'll grab um, a paper towel and I'll just pull it, I'll pull um, all the paint out. I'll kind of brush it on the canvas, see if there's a little bit of paint in there, pull it again, make sure you get most of it out. Um, and then when I'm done, I just stick it in um, Murphy's oil soap. 
and I can keep cheap brushes. I replace my brushes about every year and a half. And I spend, believe it or not, probably about 20 bucks a year on brushes. And I paint all the time. So, yeah. Yeah. So walnut oil. Walnut oil, yeah. Um, yeah. Did you employ any unique techniques or systems to learn skills that help you practice consistently and stay on track when you were getting started? Um, any unique things? Um, I trying to think. Um, things to keep me tr on track, just sort of like ways of thinking about it. Maybe D does that sound right? Like um, I'm trying to understand the question a little bit. Sorry. Um, when I was starting out, ways to kind of stay on track. I did, Alex, does that sound correct? Yeah. Okay. This is uh, the question you see in the little box is the current question. Oh, okay. I see. Did you employ any unique techniques? Um, not really. Um, what I did was um, when I was starting out, um, I did a ton of life drawing, and that was that was my that was my schooling, um, and I was just so insanely into it like i took i can't even tell you how many life drawing classes i took um that i just felt like i had um my entire life ahead of me of study and i just never had, was lacking for anything to do so basically my my study when i started out would be we had jet we had basically three classes we had um quick sketch which would be um two minute to five minute poses then we had um figure drawing which was the full figure and then we had head drawing and it was basically those three classes interspersed and in each one of those things um i, I like i say i i still to this day have like a laundry list of like oh my god that's stuff i need to study so um i had a lot of structure in my in my education and it kept me um never lacking any answers of what to do next Okay. What medium does Brit use to thin out oil paint? Um, walnut oil. That's it. Um, so nothing else but walnut oil. Uh, so I don't use any solvents. Um, I stopped because uh, I think I talked about this last um, Q&A, but I watched a video from the painter Morgan Weisling many, many years ago. And I think unless I'm misunderstanding it, I think he was using only walnut oil as well. And I was like, well, I'll try that. Why not? Like, there's nothing great about turpentine running through my lungs and in my house and I use walnut oil and it works beautifully. Um, and I, sh I might add as well, um, I, you know, I've got some paintings that are like, you know, 15 years old and they have no yellowing whatsoever on them. So it works beautifully. Did you ever try lavender oil? I believe Catherine was mentioning that yesterday. It's on, my list. it's on my list. We were talking about putting that little dot in there. Yeah. It's on my list of speaking of yeah. learning new things. Yeah. It's on my list of things to do. Okay. Uh, ju just asking out of curiosity. No, I'm going to. When, when I, um, I'm actually not able to paint this week, sadly. I'm looking. Um, this looks like I got my life together. If I showed you the periphery, it's not. <laughs> got, we're moving the studio. I've got, I've got a painting. All my painting supplies are in a mess in front of me, and I can't get to it. So don't, don't believe the illusion. Uh, we have a question on walnut oil. How do you do fat over lean with just walnut oil? um less walnut oil so um so uh, presumably what you mean is just um is i just is yeah that's absolutely how i paint just 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 i'll thin it and i'll paint my um thin painting underneath um in the thin parts and then and then with um with the fat parts just less less medium basically and i don't i don't get the canvas like sloppy wet like like if it were nothing if it were just sloppy wet i'd be having problems um and if it is sloppy wet i'll actually grab my rag and and kind of um rub into the canvas which will sort of keep my colors intact and my drawings intact underneath so yeah um, just less medium basically when i go fat okay um Okay, Maya on Discord is asking, do you have some tips for how to make the most of a plain air painting workshop? Things to pay attention to, questions to ask, subjects to pick, etc. Sure. In particular, for someone relatively new to painting. Yeah. Um, so Maya, what I would say is, I'm only going to come at this from my perspective. Um, the thing that's tricky for me with, with plain air is that there's just so much to paint. Um, so, so for me, um, it comes down a lot to formula, which can sort of backfire on you. But, but what I mean is formula in landscape would be 
there's a foreground, there's a middle ground, there's a background, there's a leading line with the path. And I do kind of lean on things like that. So um, with, for me, almost more than the figure, the landscape is about simplification. So I will oftentimes just focus on making a simple statement. I'll make my hands and go like this so I can, you know, kind of frame something and see what it would look like. I'll do a little thumbnail, um, but just concentrate on keeping it simple. And I'll give you a painter to look at. There's a painter named Matt Smith, M-A-T-T, -T, and the last name is S-M-I-T-H. And Matt Smith paints all his plein air paintings with a, one flat brush. and they're really nice, but they're really simple. And I think they're really um, solid statements to look at for that kind of thing. So that's a good painter to look at for that kind of thing. Okay. Yeah. Do you have any advice on how to learn to find your voice in art? Are there different practices to stand out in the crowd? I think, um, I think your voice is gonna naturally happen. And I think it will ultimately probably be the result more of limitations than you might imagine, which is true for me. So um, I, I found what I would consider to be my voice, which is always in flux too. I'm, I'm not committed to it. I, I'm gonna sort of go on and do whatever I want. It might change, um, but I found it through my limitations. So I always kind of wanted to, um, you guys might be familiar with James Jean. I really wanted to paint like James Jean, just detail and flowers and like an earring with a million details, another earring. I love that stuff. And I tried and tried and tried and I just, boy, they are bad results like their bad results. So eventually, um, actually this kind of goes back, I was earning my MFA degree and I was in trouble because I was, we have to produce a body of work that you defend. And I was trying to do work like that and it was bad. And I knew it was bad and I was gonna be in trouble. And I eventually was just like, I need to do something I can do. I know how to paint, let's go for it. And I just painted what came naturally to me. And also I think, um, pay attention to it because I think your voice is always there and I think it's natural. And I think you're gonna find, this is where it's tricky. Um, you're gonna find things that are things that you need to work on. And then you're gonna find things that are just never going to happen. And it's hard to kind of suss out what's what. So sometimes you can be like, I'm never gonna learn that. It might just be a matter of, well, you have to practice it. And then I think at a certain point, some people it's going to be like no that person's never going to draw or paint like that that's just not in them and that's fine they're going to do something else and that's a tricky thing to work out i'll just kind of say one more thing on that um with me it's tight painting i don't um there's physical reasons i'm not a small person um i'm not a patient person i don't paint these tight little paintings um some people value that they'll say well that's kind of the real painting Nothing I can do. <laughs> it's not how I paint. You know, I'm not that guy. So um, that's my answer for it. I hope that's helpful. Okay, before we continue with questions, sure. I'm just going to interrupt for like a few seconds. Uh, I mentioned the uh, feedback form before. Um, I would just like to mention again that the guest, uh, the guest book is still going on for the uh, raffle for our swag merch for 10 year merch. So do not forget to leave your um, feedback uh, there or just tell us your thoughts on New Masters Academy, how it helped you, you know, even your complaints. We also encourage those so we can better ourselves. Okay, thank you. And now back to the questions. Yeah. Uh, Rose is asking, so does walnut oil thin your paint rather than make it more oily or fat? You got to be careful. Um, you can certainly put too much in. Um, it will just thin it out. That, that, that's, that's, it's, it's um, what, a, what water is to acrylic paint, walnut oil is, is to oil paint. It'll thin it out. Okay. Jim on Discord is asking, your paintings are very textural. Are there surfaces that you prefer, such as canvas or board? Yeah, great <clears> question. <throat> board. I'm a total board painter. Um, I don't like canvas weave. I just don't like it in my work. Um, for me, it kind of separates uh, the reality of it. Like I hate, for example, I hate if I'm trying to paint an eye and I want that highlight ding placed and there's a canvas weave in it. I just hate it. Even if you lean back and you don't see it, it drives me nuts. So um, I'm a total um, gesso board painter. I love it. I, I, I will never go back to painting on canvas, I don't think. I just, I can't stand it for a number of reasons. We could talk about it, but um, linen canvas is wonderful. Um, but that's just kind of, there's so many things with canvas that, um, um, that I found uh, challenging for me after a while. I painted on canvas for a number of years, actually. OK, 
Okay, Gordon is asking, is Murphy's oil soap to use the one found in hardware store for wood floor cleaning? Yes, it is. Yes, it Same is. <laughs> yep, exactly. Yeah, Gordon, just just you can get it anywhere. Yeah, try it. It's it's beautiful. I, it's not even from for me. Um, I can't remember. Um, some illustrator, maybe Jeff. Jeff, I forget his last name, but Jeff. There was an illustrator that posted it, and like I say, I've always I've always got my ears to the ground, and um, and I I was like, I'll try it. I'm losing a lot of brushes, and it it's brilliant. It works brilliantly. Yeah, and. Okay, sorry to keep coming back to the oil. It's something I've been wondering, but can you do the same thing with a different oil? I have linseed oil and sunflower oil. Yeah, no, no apologies, Rose. Actually, asking questions like this is wonderful. So you, I'll, this, I'll say this to all of you guys. I, it's awkward if I'm just sitting here and there's no questions. So thank you. So no, no apologies. I'll talk painting all day. Um, yes, you, you can. you can do the same thing um, with both of those. I don't know, I believe that linseed might yellow a bit more than walnut. Um, walnut for me, consent, the consensus from what I've, the research I've done and the discussions I've had has been that it yellows less and it works well for me. But yes, any any of those will work. Um, uh, they'll work just fine. And you just, um, what, what I do is I, I take the cap and I pour a little bit of, um, of my walnut oil. I put that in the corner of my canvas and I just dip my brush in a little bit as necessary. And you just thin the paint with it. Think of it, like I say, um, what uh, water is to acrylic paint. So if you just grab acrylic paint, it's going to be, it's going to be super thick. If you kind of water it down, you can paint with it almost trans very transparently if you want. Is the walnut oil the normal one you get in a grocery store or is there a special one for art supply? Grocery store. Yep. Home Depot for me. That, that's the store I use. Um, and then um, Alex, I see. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Do you rinse Murphy's oil soap or just uh, wipe off before using brush with oil? I things? actually just um, wipe it off. Yeah. I don't, I don't even know if there's, um, I've never seen, I, well, it, you'll find that if you pinch now, actually that's something else I use, um, Viva paper towels, which are kind of an almost cloth like paper towel. Now I, I'm speaking about this like home Depot and Viva as though everybody has that. And I know that's not the case. So I'll kind of try to describe what it is. And you guys, I'm sure wherever you are have an equivalent of this, it's basically just a really thick paper towel and you can, you can grab any paper towel work. Um, and, uh, and I just pinch, and pull it off and um and really if you just pinch the right way there's nothing on the brush hardly at all just try to not pull Don't the bristles, pull the bristles <laughs> out i did i did that, that was um that was interesting <laughs> mm -hmm. i believe that happened in group coaching right it did but like i said i don't i replace yeah. like every year or something so it was probably ready to go i think that was a new brush i think it was actually um i'm gonna I don't mean to slam them, but I think that was an expensive rosemary and company brush. That was like, I usually use cheap and I think that was that. <laughs> so I actually don't remember yeah. if it was or not. Yeah. But I do remember it <laughs> happening though. Yeah, what, what you <laughs> okay. Um, did you ever decide it was time to move on from video game art or did it naturally transition into what you're doing now? Um, it was natural. And to be honest with you, um, to my own fault, um, I'm horribly illogical in choices I make. I really follow my muse and just do what I want to do. And I was in the game studios kind of frustratingly um, making fine art paintings. And everybody else was like, I kid you not, serious question I was asked, what's your favorite tank? And I'm like, I don't have a favorite tank, but I, I like Mary Cassatt's paintings, you know? And um, I was always, and I love games, but I was always an odd fit that way. So um, I did a lot of painting digital, like uh, I did a lot of texturing and menus and, and things like that in the studios. And I was always the painting guy. And I was always a frustrated painter. My paintings were always like, kind of trying to look like Sargent paintings, only tiny little things on the screen like this. Yeah. Okay. Question yeah. from Rose. Uh, do you do a la prima or wait for layers to dry? Um, depends. Um, I love a la prima, but, but um, I definitely paint in layers now. So the, the common way that I've been painting for about the past, uh, well, I'd say maybe about the past three, about five years or so is I'll paint the painting relatively thin in a la prima and then i will go and i will glaze into it and then when i'm done 
I'll work thick on top of it um, and just kind of do that last layer really thick. So um, love Ala Prima. Ala Prima is a really specific kind of look. Even um, we'll talk about Richard Schmidt, who's got the book called Ala Prima. Even that, as realistic as it looks, it takes on a very specific look. And I actually love the look of sort of a combo. So um, sort of Ala Prima pass, uh, glaze, 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 and then end with an Ala Prima. That's kind of how I do it. So it's a little bit of all of it. Okay, we have uh, quite an interesting yeah. question here. I paint in gouache, but I want to not use cadmium paints mm -hmm. if I can help it. The only one left in my palette now is cad orange. Is there anything comparable? I don't know, because the cat the cats are kind of what they are. Um, if if you want to feel better about this, I'm I'm joking here, but it's true. Um, there's a painter, one of the Wyatts, um, N. C. Wyatt's. Um, grandson, Andrew's um, son, Jamie Wyatt. There's a video of him on YouTube. He's a great painter, but he's painting, licking the cadmiums. Don't even ask me why he's doing it, but it's specifically like the cad yellows. And he's like 85 or something like that at this point. So that said, I know it's not great for you, but um, I get what you're saying. Um, I don't think there's any substitute for him. I think um, those really saturated yellows like cad red or a cad yellow, um, they're they're not going to be like yellow ochre. They're just a different color. So unfortunately, I think if you want it, you kind of got to have it. I wear gloves, by the way, rubber gloves when I paint. Additional protection. Yeah. Um, are the brushes left sitting in the Murphy oil or just the brush and leave it on? Um, no, I, 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 left, I leave them to sit. And um, the question that's always asked is, will it push the bristles out of shape? And for me, it does not. Um, I use flats. And I've even used badger hair brushes and um, they really don't, it doesn't happen. One thing that you could do if you're worried about that is you could tape the brushes to a surface and then just kind of tape them to the wall and have them hanging in, in the Murphy's oil soap, that might work. Um, but I don't have that problem. I, I just leave them like down and um, they come out uh, like new brushes. Another question from Rose. Yeah. So if I did a la prima with just walnut oil or linseed oil, would it still work? Thank you again for all your No, answers. Rose, this is awesome. Okay, I super appreciate it. Um, if you used, um, um, uh, I think it would be, let me see, where's, I'm looking for the question again. Oh, great. So if I did a la prima with walnut it's oil, yeah. Um, absolutely, yeah, totally. No, it's it's just like it's just like turp. Um, I, I've, I do, I've done that for years. Yeah, it works just fine, just like turp. Yeah. Okay. All right. We are actually at time. We have one more minute left to go. Britt, do you have any yeah. parting um, words? I'm just saying um, thank you so much for having me. I truly meant what I said. Um, I think you guys are insanely lucky to have these demos recorded and presented like this. Um, I can't emphasize this enough. I lived out in Los Angeles and I used to travel hours and hours and hours um, to study with these people and they're so well presented and it's all right there. So um, just once again, um, I think we're all really lucky to be part of this. It's amazing um, what they put together here. I just think it's the coolest thing. Okay, before we leave, I would like to say that after this Q and A, everybody is welcome into our uh, community digital campus. So over on our Discord, we're going to be having an event soon for uh, a long study of uh, a figure pose. So everybody welcome there. Okay. Also, if you like this Q&A with Britt, uh, he is with us every Monday at 1 p.m. PT in our group coaching sessions. He does critiques and discussions, and they are always very interesting. Right. The last one, I believe, was uh, how to paint cheaper, right? Exactly. How to on a budget. budget. Yeah, I think we're doing head structure yeah. next which is so much fun i love talking about heads yeah i believe that's in a week from yeah, now, yeah i think it's just regular if i'm on the yeah exactly yeah okay so with that brit thank you so much no for problem. your time it's as always it's lovely to chat with yeah, you awesome. <laughs> so and i, I should yeah. have all my stuff and be in a beautiful studio in about two weeks so i'm, I'm interesting time but thank you guys like i said it's about 90 degrees here but um got to yeah, anyway. Okay. Yeah, go go yeah, cool yeah. off. <laughs> All right, folks. Okay, we'll talk soon. Thanks. All right. Thank Take you care. so Thanks much. Thanks for coming, everybody. Have a nice, have a nice day, everybody. Bye. Goodbye. Bye.